Kraken Pro is the powerful crypto platform for experienced traders who demand the best. With advanced charts, real-time market analytics, and lightning-fast trade execution, Kraken Pro empowers you to trade your way. Customize your setup and make every pixel count by rearranging and stacking trading modules in a way that makes sense to you. On Kraken Pro, you have the freedom to put your favorite market analytics and execution tools exactly where you need them. And whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, Kraken Pro has everything you need to navigate over 210 plus assets with confidence. Join the thousands of seasoned traders who trust Kraken Pro. Visit realvision.com slash Kraken Pro. Hi, everyone. Is it time to rethink the Fed? That's the question we're wondering about. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Maggie Lake. With me today is Jared Dillian, editor of the Daily Dirt Map newsletter. Hi, Jared. Hey, how you doing? It's great to see you. Uh, yeah. Before we before we jump into talking about the markets today, um, the biggest investment decision many of us are going to make today is whether to go with Iowa or UConn in the Women's March Madness that goes off tonight. Brian put a poll up on YouTube. Let's get the hive mind going. Uh, we'll check in before the end of the show. Looks like it was 50-50 so far. Um, and feel feel free uh, to weigh in on the chat on the platform as well. Um, if we if we look at it, looks like we have a little bit of a division when it comes to sort of what to do here, uh, Jared, because we had a really interesting session. We had the U.S. monthly jobs number came in stronger than expected. Treasury yields moved higher, but so did stocks, which seems a little counterintuitive. We had all the indices higher, although not enough to offset what is still a losing week. What did you make of the data? Uh, you know, the data I think is, look, I mean, first of all, let me just preface this by saying that um, bond yields are kind of in no man's land here. The economic data is a no man's land. Really, we're arguing about whether we get one cut or two cuts or three cuts. And, you know, we're kind of leaning towards less cuts at this point. Uh, and the whole idea of getting cuts while you're printing 300,000 on jobs and stuff like that is kind of insane to begin with. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I can't explain the price action in stocks today. Mm. Um, yesterday, that meltdown during the day was very bearish to me. Mm. Um, it was not a close that you would want to buy. Uh, it was a very ugly close. Uh, futures traded up a little bit overnight. Um, like I said, I can't explain the price action today. I thought we would get some follow through today. But yesterday, if you're familiar with the term outside reversal, that's when the market opens on the highs above the previous day's highs and closes on the lows before the below the previous day's lows. That's what we had yesterday. Um, today could be an inside day and we could walk in Monday and things could be different. But, you know, with gold rallying, oil rallying, the VIX jumping, you know, 20, 25 percent, this kind of smells like a geopolitical trade to me. Mm. Um, you know, we heard rumors about uh, Iran attacking Israel. Um, there's there's always a possibility that. You know, Putin just elected himself for another six more years, so he could attack um, Lithuania and go for Kaliningrad. Um, you know, there's the Middle East, there's still Ukraine. Like, there's with there's an underlying bid to commodities, and like I said, this just all feels like a geopolitical trade to me, and the risk reward for owning stocks just is not there. So, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 you put that very well because that is what's sort of swirling around. Um, and I, I want to go through some highlights because it, it, we've really seen that kind of concern that you just articulated come up throughout our conversations all week. I just want to flag on the geopolitical front that um, for members and people have access to the platform, which you should if you don't, uh, Andreas had a great conversation with Marco Papich that's so worth seeing um, to get a, a better sense of what Jared's talking about on the on the geopolitical front. But we have been hearing, Jared, a lot of concern about the trends in inflation, what it means for rates, and the problems it creates with policymakers, especially with those debt levels we're talking about. Here are some of the highlights from the conversations, and we'll talk on the other side. 
if this is immigration, um, then there's a head of steam on this and this thing could speed up rather than slow down. Profits could speed up rather than slow down. Everything could speed up. So what happened is, you know, it feels like the market's got a whiff of, you know, the inflation bug is back. You've got rates ratcheting higher right away, right out of the chutes in April, right? I think in response to, you know, that commodity bubbling that we just went over. Mm -hmm. um, and so now you've got higher yields. You got tens pushing the upper end of the range. You got stocks rotating where, dare I say, technology looks a little bit vulnerable. We believe, and much like Jim Bianco believes, is that the longer term trend in interest rates is probably higher because, again, we have this fundamental view uh, that's based on the confluence of our quantitative research and our econometric forecasting tools that says inflation is probably going to bottom at a level that is inconsistent with 2% inflation. Mm -hmm. That's probably a Q3, Q4 event. We expect markets to start to sniff that out and price that in uh, in Q3. Now, global liquidity expansion is monetary inflation in my terms, and therefore what you need are dedicated monetary inflation hedges. And those dedicated monetary inflation hedges are gold, and we suspect, and I use the word suspect, cryptocurrencies. We don't know because the timeline or the history is too short, but certainly that's how they behave. Uh, Bitcoin behaves like ex exponential gold. Some great stuff. Just a programming note. Harry is going to sit down with Warren Mosler. We talked about it in the show to dig into that question about what's really driving the U.S. economy. Is it fiscal? Is it something else? It's it's a, a question that's really important to Harry to get the answer to because it dictates so much of what will happen um, with rates and, and with portfolios. So mark your calendars. And again, if you don't have a Real Vision platform membership, now's the time to get one. Otherwise, you're going to miss out on this good stuff. So Jared, what what are you expecting in terms of rates? Do you also see, because the, the the conclusion from this is we're reflating, inflation is going to be a problem. We've already seen people ratchet back those Fed expectations, but are we actually going to see treasuries move back up into that five, five and a quarter, five and a half percent range? Is that what you see happening? Um, I don't have strong opinions about it. I mean, I looked today, I looked at the expected number for CPI next Wednesday. And the headline number is expected at 3.5%. And I think it's worth pointing out that inflation bottomed like eight months ago, and it's been mm -hmm. creeping higher ever since. And I think you'd have to be living under a rock not to see the inflationary pressures building throughout the economy. Like it's everywhere you look, whether you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or the grocery store, or McDonald's or whatever, like inflation hasn't gone away. It slowed down for a period of time, but it hasn't gone away. What does that mean for bond yields? I mean, like I said, technically bonds are kind of in no man's land. Uh, if I had to choose between one way or another, I would probably choose higher yields. Mm. Um, the one thing I want to point out is like a lot of people have noticed that bond yields are going up and gold is going up at the same time, which shouldn't that doesn't make any sense because if interest rates are going up that should theoretically make gold less attractive because gold doesn't pay any interest um i put out a thread on twitter yesterday uh which was pretty popular and i talked about why gold is rallying in spite of the higher interest rates and what i said was is that higher interest rates actually increase the probability that at some point we will monetize the debt so to back up a second, you know, a couple of years ago, interest expense in the federal budget was about 300 billion. Now it's at 1.1 trillion. If interest rates go up, if, if 10 say go up to five and a half or six percent, the we are in fiscal checkmate. There is nothing we can do. And at some point in the next five years, there will be political pressure on the Fed to cap interest rates for two reasons. One, so people can continue to buy cars and houses and stuff like that. But two, because you can't allow interest expense on the debt to go any higher. Mm -hmm. So if the Fed caps interest rates and they print money to buy an unlimited amount of bonds at a certain yield level, that's when gold goes parabolic. So when interest rates go up, it actually increases the probability of that happening which is good for gold. And that's why gold is doing what it's doing. 
Yeah, I think I think that I and and your notes have been fantastic about gold. I encourage everyone to go look at them. And you have been talking about this for a while. I know it's been on your radar. Um, talk to me about the price action as well, because there is a feeling that you see the headline "Gold's in record territory," and everybody's either thinks they've missed it or, you know, are wondering if it's time to take profits. Um, you know, because it's been this sort of disappointing trade for a long time. Are we in a different era? Like, how do you think about the price action here? So the way I, the way I think about the price action is we had a 13-year consolidation from between 2011 and 2024. We just broke out of the consolidation. We broke out of a base. And like every all the emails I get from subscribers or anybody else is asking when to take profits. When do we sell gold? When do we sell gold? When do we take profits? And I'm like, did you just see what happened to Coco? Right? Like imagine Coco had like a 47 year base and it broke out of this base. And if it traded up a couple hundred bucks and you're like, okay, time to get profit, time to take profits. Like you want to hang yourself. You know, so anytime commodities like sort of commodities writ large, like any commodity breaks out of a base, it's going to run for a long time. So, look, there's always a time to sell something. I'm not like the Bitcoin people who refuse to sell Bitcoin at any price and then take a giant drawdown. There's going to be a time to sell gold, but it is way early to be talking about that. It's super, super early. That's that's I think that's so so helpful to say that. And we have Christopher in the chat saying, do not fade as well. He's looking at different technicals, uh, Elliot action, et cetera. Thank you for that, Christopher. Um, what about buying it, Jared, if you haven't? Well, you don't I have think- it in your portfolio because I just, I remind everyone all the time. Um, and if you've been watching our coverage, we, we talk to people about all different kinds of assets, right? Um, pe- there are people who think Bitcoin's the way to go. There are people who've been arguing for a long time that gold is the way to go. They were wrong some of the time, but Rick Rule was out, you know, last year talking to me about how low a percentage it is in Peeper's por- portfolio. And he was just saying even an incremental change makes a difference um, in addition to a bunch of other stuff. So what about if you don't have it in your portfolio? Should you? So Rick Rule is right. So everybody is massively underinvested. In No Worries, my book, in the awesome portfolio, I recommend that everybody should have 20% gold, mostly for portfolio and risk reduction reasons. But I believe everybody should have 20% gold. I think the average person has about 1% gold, right? I mean, a lot of people have more than that, but so many people have none, right? So I think the average person has 1% gold. Um, all it, what we are seeing is reflexivity in action, right? We just saw the price go up 15%. And now people are asking themselves, gosh, maybe I should own gold. Maybe I'm underinvested. Maybe I should, you know, get involved. And this is this is literally Soros' definition of reflexivity. It's happening right before our eyes. People are getting sucked into this trade. And it's just incredible to watch. It's got a long way to go. Uh, I'm so interested if if sort of weigh in if you all feel like you're underweight gold. Um, it's such an interesting because listen, as you said, a, a consolidation period of 13 years that's a long time. I mean, for some people, this has been sort of a dead trade, um, and they've been you know much in the way that we talked about 60 40 forever for bonds. They've been told that you know gold goes nowhere, and um, you know you better use your capital elsewhere. So this is going to be a really interesting time. What about from like an institutional point of view, Jared? Do you think that um, that when we say people are underweight, is it re- just retail or is it across the board at all kinds of funds are underweight? It, it's it's across the board. It's everybody. It's central banks. Central banks mm-hmm. are underweight. You know, I mean, Gordon Brown sold all the gold out of the Bank of England back in like 2000. You know, for all the mining that Canada does, the Bank of Canada doesn't have any gold, you know, so everybody is underweight. Uh, I mean, it's it's almost comical. So I think I think this will continue until you start seeing some of the strategists at the banks changing their portfolio allocations. And they say, well, we're not going to do 60, 40 anymore. We're going to do 60, 30, 10 or something like that. And they're going to have an allocation to gold, and then it's going to be time to sell. 
So. Mm, yeah. So just a reminder, there, there is, uh, as Jared said at the beginning, this isn't a forever <laughs> recommendation. There will be a time, but that time is not right now. Um, so let's talk about stocks a little bit, because it seems like from your scenario, you feel like they're very vulnerable here. Is it across the board? Is it just a risk-off environment? Or do you feel like some sectors will do well in this? It, there's a sort of a rotation and it's maybe going to be money out of tech or some of the higher high-flying, fast-moving areas, higher risk uh, areas. There is there there's a rotation going going on as we speak. Like take a look at basic materials. Like yeah. basic materials are making new highs. Energy is done really well. Tech is kind of losing steam here. So that rotation is happening. I, I don't really have anything quantitative to say quantitative to say about stocks, other than just that I have a bad feeling. And the other thing that I'll point out is well, that- Well, we pay attention with you. When you say you have feelings, <laughs> your spidey sense comes up. It's, we pay attention to that. Um, you know, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at the ratio of the S&P to gold, okay, or you can do the Dow gold ratio or the S&P gold ratio. But if you look at the chart, it's making lower highs and lower lows. So, you know, gold and stocks are not necessarily always negatively correlated, but- the ratio of gold to stocks should go up over time. And also an interesting thing, somebody pointed out to me, every time I talk about gold, I can't see the comments, but people are probably putting Bitcoin in the comments. What about Bitcoin? What about Bitcoin? Like if you look at a chart of gold over Bitcoin over the last couple of years, it's gone relentlessly lower, but it's made a double bottom and it's starting to pick up. So I think we, we might be entering a period of time where gold actually outperforms Bitcoin for a while. I think that's possible. Yeah, we, we uh, surprisingly we hadn't had a a comment yet, but I'm sure that I'm sure they're there. Um, I'm not looking at the YouTube chat. I'm just looking on our platform. But Sarah did say no need for gold when you see the gold versus Bitcoin chart in Raul and Julian's business cycle update this week. That's something that's out on our platform. They update um and have a a. a rolling uh, macro investing tool uh, to help guide. Um, so, you know, Raul's supposition has been that crypto well performs gold. But of course, you, as you mentioned, we've been in a consolidation period. Not so much versus each other, but how are you thinking about gold? I and mean, that last clip we played for Michael Howe, he was like, listen, you want hedges against monetary inflation, the monetization of debt, and you certainly want to think about gold and then potentially Bitcoin that's been acting like exponential gold, but there's, but Michael's caveat was that there's not a lot of data yet on that. So are, we know you're bullish on gold. How are you thinking about Bitcoin? Um, I mean, I look like, you know, people call Bitcoin a hard asset and I suppose it is because the supply is theoretically limited and you know, the fundamentals are actually great at the moment because we just launched all these ETFs and they have like 50 billion in assets and they continue to attract assets. Um, yeah, I would, you know, I would take a look at that gold over Bitcoin chart, you know, like, I, I don't know if you're pulling it up there. I can't see it, but um, it looks like it's, it I think looks this is like just Bitcoin. Bottom. Is that just yeah. Bitcoin? Yeah, I think it might yeah. be just Bitcoin, but. So. The voice of Brian yeah. appears. Uh, so what are you saying about uh, versus gold? What were you saying? I interrupted you. I, th I think gold is going to outperform over the at least the next couple of months and maybe longer. I think it's going to outperform Bitcoin. So do you do you would you be thinking about having Bitcoin, even though gold's going to outperform? Would you be thinking about having Bitcoin in your portfolio? I mean, it's like speaking for me personally, like I've owned Bitcoin before. And um, if I owned it again, I would own it in the form of the ETFs mm. um, because the taxes, I mean, if you do it on Coinbase, the taxes are a pain in the ass and it's just a hassle. And, you know, I don't feel like dealing with it. I'd rather have it in a brokerage account and get a 1099 and do the taxes that way. Mm -hmm. So if I owned it again, I would, I would actually buy the ETF, but I have no plans to do that in the immediate future. Interesting. So uh, uh, let me take Quentin's question. Gold miners are finally participating in a rally, nearly 50% nearly under their all-time high still. Do they keep going? 
So does the gold rally extend to gold miners, do you think, Jared? Well, the GDX has gone from 25 to 33 in the last month, uh, which is about a 30% return. Still, gold, there, was, there was a chart going around Twitter a couple, uh, couple of weeks ago that showed that miners were the cheapest relative to gold in history. Mm. And there was another chart with Newmont that did it specifically with Newmont that showed that Newmont was the cheapest relative to gold in history. I do have an allocation of miners. Um, it's probably four or five percent of what my allocation to spot gold is, but I do have some miners. Um, you want the miners for that optionality. Um, I mean, look like if miners if miners return to sort of like you know forty year mean valuations, then it's a three to five x trade from here. You know, so. Good question, Quentin. Um, This isn't, boy, you guys are on fire this Friday. It's another great question for Mark. To my question, our conversation about gold as a portion of people's portfolio. Mark asking, Jared, conversely, do you think the average person has too much technology? Oh my God, yeah. Holy cow, absolutely, absolutely. And the amazing thing about this is, this is sort of like one of my pet peeves. Everybody owns Apple. Like everybody has a stock. And everybody's cost basis is super, super low. People have owned Apple for 10, 20, 30 years. And I hear the dumbest things from people all the time about Apple and Google and all these tech stocks. They say, well, if I sell it, then I have to pay taxes. And I'm like, dummy, like if you don't sell it and pay the taxes, then you will have losses. Like, so what would you rather have? Would you rather pay taxes? Or would you rather lose money, right? Like people, it's it, people just have this mental block around like taking gains and paying taxes. Take the gains, pay the taxes. The taxes are, are a symbol that you actually did well in the trade. Like just pay the taxes. It's incredible. But yeah. people, people are just sitting on mountains of capital gains with these stocks and they'll never sell because they have to pay the taxes. Yeah. Um, and drawdowns are painful, you know, I mean, it, it, they're the, the buy and hold and ride through and it has worked sometimes, but this is really important to know your time frame. We talk about that. We bang on about this all the time. But if you need that money, you don't want to go through a, da- a drawdown. It's super painful, but it's really hard. It's hard to make that decision, Jared, taxes aside sometimes. I mean, I guess my point is there's always another apple, Right. A lot of people say, like, this has been the best trade of all time. I can't sell it. Look, there's always another trade. There's always something to do. You take profits in one trade, you move on to the next trade, and maybe that works out well, too. So, Mm. Um, Boy, this is, okay, uh, I'm going to do Nick's first. I'm going to get to yours, Lee. You win the, so far win the question of the day. But Nick is asking, because it's kind of related to what we're talking about. Um, hi, Jared. Just like in uranium, do you see any other trades that are overcrowded? Do you see any a holes in other trades? What looks <laughs> cra- overcrowded? People just love that. Yeah, that's that's like uh, on on uh, I don't want to say on your tombstone, but you're in your in your sort of bio on your books. Like, should be something about that famous comment about coin the uranium assholes. Too yeah. many a holes in uranium. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I. I mean, really, I would just say tech at the moment. Um, I mean, certainly not commodities. I will say that the weight loss drugs, uh, pharma companies are probably overpriced at this point by a lot. Um, and this comes at a time, you know, I've taken the weight loss drugs. I've taken Ozempic. I've taken Zepbound. Oh, really? Uh, How'd you find it? Uh it actually works. You know, I've lost, actually I've lost about 15 pounds recently. So, um, but you know, the, the weight loss drugs that I was taking were a thousand dollars a month mm-hmm. and you can get them <clears throat> at a compounding pharmacy for $300 a month. Right. So, and then you have Bernie Sanders talking about how the weight loss drugs are egregiously expensive and the markup is so big and stuff like that. There's going to be a lot of price pressure on these drugs because everybody is going to want to take them. 
So this is not a time I would buy Novo or Eli Lilly. Like I think I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a little, a little scared to short these stocks, but I think these are definitely overowned at this point. That's really, I think that's very helpful because I you know it's been so much in the news and in the zeitgeist that I think a lot of people think about that and, you know, think about the potential. Um, so it's really interesting to hear you say that. Uh, I had to ask this question from Lay. Um, boy, this is a this is just like a this, I don't even know. We we'd have to do many shows on the answer to this. But I'm going to ask it anyway because it's so good. Um, Jared, do you think there is a fundamental reordering of the international monetary system underway, as well as a changing mindset of the definition of money? Boy, Lee, you are in a philosophical mood this Friday. Oh, well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very deep question, but it's it, there's actually an easy answer, and the answer is no. There's no fundamental reordering of the monetary system. Not to say that it can't happen in the next five to ten years. Um, have you ever heard my my saying about um, the dollar as the reserve currency? What would make the dollar lose its reserve currency status? What? If the U.S. loses an aircraft carrier, oh, right. So if you think about all the reserve currencies in history, like we, the dollar is the reserve currency now. But who had the reserve currency before? It was the British, and they lost a naval war. And before the British, it was the Spanish, and they lost a naval war. If you lose a naval war, you, you the the navy is how we project power across the world, right? Mm. So an, an aircraft carrier is symbolic of the Navy. If, an air, if you lose an aircraft carrier, that means that you will no longer have the world's reserve currency. Does that still hold when we may be looking at wars that are fought with drones? Uh, that's a good question. That's that a, good question. a good question, right? Yeah. Um, this is why folks, we have D Smith on and folks like Marco Papich on because, um, there's a lot that's changing, right? And so all of these things are hard to plug together, especially when you're trying to think about it from an investment lens. So we have big, long, deep conversations with folks who are thinking about these things far out into the future, including Raul, who, you know, everyone should know by now says he can't even see beyond 2030, because it's so crazy. I mean, there's so much going on. Um, I just wanted to point out in the um, chat, Mark just said, just to flip back, uh, that, uh, and Jared, you've talked about Bitcoin being a stressful asset to own. It's definitely volatile. You definitely have to understand your appetite. Um, and Mark just pointing out, Jamie did a great session on sizing positions two weeks ago. Um, so worth checking out. Jamie's, we're going to have Jamie again on the show. Um, and we'll, you know, break it down because a lot of people are beginning to dip their toe into this area. So um, with that in mind, we're going to be covering that if you're trying to figure out what to do. But he has, if you're a little bit further down the learning curve on that and you do hold it in your portfolio, he has some really, really great sessions on that. Um, and we've got a new crypto academy coming as well. So we'll keep you posted on all that. Um, this is a great question. Uh, short-term trading is asking, what about China? What about China short-term trading? Can you be a little bit more specific about that? And then, and then I'll throw it at Jared. In the meantime, um, OTD, DE, uh, DGEN, uh, ODTE, DGEN rather, will silver repeat its historic relation to the gold move? Uh, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question, but this has been a good week for silver for sure. Uh, probably the first good week in a while. I don't know if you, I don't know if any, anybody saw this, but um, there was a tweet from the New York Post. There was an article. Uh, there was this uh, woman, she, she's wearing like bikinis and stuff like that. And the quote was, uh, I make $100,000 a month by humiliating men. And I said, You're silver. <laughs> 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 that's great jared <laughs> oh god that's so good listen if you if you don't if you don't already and you haven't read it um jared's note is 
so good, not only about, and, and as I said, his stuff on gold has been terrific. A lot of historical context around it and ways to think about trading from a from a str- strategical point of view and a sentiment point of view. But he's also got tons of just culture stuff and, and amazing stuff and very funny stuff in the note as well. It's so entertaining. Um, so it's worth checking out. And he's on our marketplace, remember. So if you are a member, you get a special rate to Jared's newsletter through the market place, which is great. Um, so where, Brian, where are we on the poll, by the way? Can you stick that in? Or you want to come on and tell us? Paul English is like, definitely don't bet against Caitlin Clark. But, you know, this UConn team is really tough. Well, I'm from, I'm from Connecticut, so I'm betting on UConn. You're betting on UConn? You're going with yeah. UConn? Ah, oh, it's so hard. They're so good. I think it's going to be, we were looking before, oh, let's see. Uh, oh, I think there's a sentimental favorite going into this. Iowa, 61% to Connecticut, 38%. We checked the bet betting spreads before Brian, Super Mario, and I went down the rabbit hole, and it's it looks like they're all expecting a really tough, close game. So it's going to be super fun. Um, okay, we're out of time, but gold, go gold is what I'm taking away from this, Jared. Bullish gold. Anything else that you like or really hate that you feel super convicted about? Um, Argentina is still working. We oh, my gosh. Argentina. Harry was talking about Argentina at the beginning of the week, and we thought of you. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's it's been a really good trade. Let's put it that way. So um, more to come on that. All right, we're gonna we're gonna dig into that a little bit next time. Um, but it's really great stuff, Jerry. We always like closing out the week with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And we wanted to give a shout out to some RVIP members who enjoyed a wine tasting with Raoul yesterday in Cayman and a great conversation with Chintai. Um, they had a lot of fun and definitely quaff some pretty good kava from what I hear. So we're super jealous. There's some fun stuff coming up in Singapore and Dubai. So if you are in those regions, message us on the platform and we'll keep you posted. And of course, we'll try to get one going here stateside as well. Thanks, everybody. Hope it was a profitable week for you. Have a great weekend. Take care and good luck out there. Kraken Pro is the powerful crypto platform for experienced traders who demand the best. With advanced charts, real-time market analytics, and lightning-fast trade execution, Kraken Pro empowers you to trade your way. Customize your setup and make every pixel count by rearranging and stacking trading modules in a way that makes sense to you. On Kraken Pro, you have the freedom to put your favorite market analytics and execution tools exactly where you need them. And whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, Kraken Pro has everything you need to navigate over 210 plus assets with confidence. Join the thousands of seasoned traders who trust Kraken Pro. Visit realvision.com slash Kraken Pro.